Hi guys, before we go into our destination of solving these physical problems, we need to spend a few minutes to discuss about this thing called the potentials. Now remember I talked about that the problems we're dealing with involves a particle moving through a certain potential, okay? So today we need to talk about that because we see that really, uh, based on the potential, okay, it will detect the method and the solutions to the problem. So we need to talk about what these things are, what potentials are all about, and today is about that. Alright, where we left off, uh, we talked about solving the time independent showing the equation, which is given by this equation over here. Okay, the second order time independent showing the equation. And this quantity that we have here, V uh, in terms of x, is what we call as the potential. All right, and this E is uh, the energy, okay? It's the energy of the particle, okay? Of the particle over here. And this uh, potential, okay, V, can take, you know, all sorts of different types, right? So really, we need to see that, you know, based on the different types of potentials, you know, how are we going to do, what are we going to do to solve the solutions? Now, what I can say is that really, as we compare, okay, the potential with the energy, okay, there are two main categories that we can classify them into. So really, we want to look at these two uh, categories. So I'll first talk about the states are completely determined, the states are the phi x, are completely determined by the size of the system's energy. The system, what we have is the potential and the particle, right? So the states are completely determined by the size of the system's energy. Because of that, okay, it implies that when solving the time independent showing the equation, we will consider separately the cases where the energy is smaller or larger than the potential. This energy is the energy of the particle and this potential is what is given to us. Alright, so that is our main uh, methodology. Now, I can anticipate, or at least we can anticipate in the future, that in solving the time independent showing the equation, we will somehow, you know, rearrange terms, you know, where the phi, okay, as we can see, this is phi uh, by itself and phi by itself, when the energy is either less than the potential or when the energy is more than the potential, okay? And these is the two main categories that I'm talking about. All right, because um, maybe if you if those mathematicians are good enough, okay, you can see that uh, when we phi, okay, when we arrange that and put phi on one side, really this can either be, oh sorry, v, oh wait, whether e is less than v or e is more than v, detects the coefficient of the phi, and that detects the solution of the second order, uh, second order uh, differential equation. So these are the two main categories that we have. Now, first things first, classical mechanics, right? Uh, we know in classical mechanics that. Uh, the potential, or uh, those who study gravity, okay, the potential is something like the potential is zero at, at infinity, okay, and then you know the potential is an attractive force. Now, throw away the idea that the potential is zero at infinity. There is no really notion about that, okay. We are given a potential, but there is no, you know, where is the potential zero at infinity or what? Uh, we need to throw that away. So we have sometimes infinity potentials, okay, but uh, that notion really is not useful to us, so we can throw that away. Uh, what we can keep is that really the, the potential is an attractive force okay we let's keep that the idea that the potential is attractive force are uh, in quantum mechanics okay so that is what we want to do okay look when the energy is less than the potential or when the energy is more than the potential so let's look at the first case okay the energy is less than the potential when this occurs what we would have okay is known as a bound state Okay, the state is again the solution to the time independent showing the equation. So we will have something as a bound state. And when this occurs, we know for sure, okay, that the energy values, okay, of the particle we're gonna be it's gonna be discrete. Okay, so it'll be we have a discrete energy spectrum. What does discrete energy spectrum mean? It means that the, the, the particle is only allowed certain values. Now we can't see that now, okay, because we have not gone into the mathematics, but we anticipate that when the energy of the particle is less okay, then the potential, we will have a discrete energy spectrum. Now, these are the properties of a bound state, okay? First one, the particle is confined or bound at all energies, okay, to move within a finite region, okay, to move within a finite region. I can now bring another uh, classical analogy to it, which is quite easy to understand. Imagine a comet moving out of space, right? So as it moves towards the Earth's orbit, okay, it gets trapped inside the Earth's atmosphere, Okay, and it will move around the Earth. It will circle around the Earth. Now, when that happens, the motion, if you notice, of the comet is confined. Okay, and it's confined at, at different energy values. So, if it moves around a small orbit around the Earth, the energy value is not that high. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure about my classical physics, but I know it's a certain energy value. But as it moves uh, at a bigger orbit around the Earth, it has a larger energy value. But what's important is that the motion of the comet is confined, just like this over here. 
Okay. Now it is, and and we can also use what we call boundary conditions. Okay, boundary conditions and normalization. Okay, so in order to see that, I need to introduce to you to the graph over here. Okay, not easy to understand, but it can help us uh, in our study. Now, what I have over here is the motion of the particle, okay, as, as um, it goes to minus infinity in terms of the x-axis or plus infinity towards the positive x-axis. As you can see, it's one-dimensional, what we are dealing with. And uh, what I can sketch on this graph is a sample potential. Okay, so this is the first potential that you'll be seeing, okay, and it's one of the main potentials, but it's a sample potential, you know, it's just uh, drawn over here like so. Alright, so this is the, the potential. The potential is the, the vertical axis. Now, I can also sketch, okay, a sample energy value of the particle, right? So I'm very sketching against the vertical axis both the potential and the energy, okay, for us to really know what it means. So we are given this potential, and let's just say, okay, that the energy of the particle is over here like this. Okay, so sorry, let me say this again. The potential, the lowest point is V1, the middle point is V0, sorry, lowest point is V0, middle point is V1, the, the highest point is V2. So these are the, the potential levels, okay? So let's just say we're given a particle placed inside this potential, okay, moving, uh, you know, minus uh, infinity plus infinity, but the energy of the particle is, you know, really um, at this level like so. And now, because of that, okay, and we can say that, you know, this potential is an attractive force, we can see that as the particle moves towards plus infinity, okay, the motion is going to be de decaying. Something as we call it as decaying over here like that, right? As you can see over here, the potential is larger than the energy value. And since the potential is somewhat like an attractive force, okay, the motion is going to be decaying. It's going to decay as it goes to plus infinity. Likewise, as it goes towards minus infinity like so, okay? Now, I, I'm going to sketch the motion of the particle when it's inside here, okay, but we're, we're, uh, you don't need to know why is it so, we, uh, we'll know in due course, okay, it's going to be what we know as oscillating, okay, and there it is, so now we know that because the energy level is less than the potential, okay, we will have a bound state, the bound state, the motion is confined and bound at all energies to move within a finite region, that's why it's decaying over here like that, okay, it, it's logically reasons out like that. Now, the last thing that we need to introduce is that there are two theorems that when we're dealing with the discrete spectrum, okay? The, the, the second one you don't need to know at all, okay? But the first one is, is fairly important, okay? And that is, the energy values are described as non-degenerate, okay? Uh, a term that is used throughout freshman physics, okay? Degeneracy. It happens a lot in, in a lot of branches, you know, statistical physics, quantum mechanics, and really you need to be careful in this meaning because, you know, it depends on the context it's used. Uh, fortunately for us, the meaning is quite easy to understand in this case over here. Um, the energy values will be non-degenerate. So what I mean by that is that when I'm given a certain energy value, okay, there's only one state, one and only one state associated to that energy value. This is the non-degenerate case. When I have a degenerate case, I have an energy value and a few states associated with that energy value, okay? That is just what you need to know. But the theorem tells us that the energy values are non-degenerate. So, for this energy value over here, there's one and only one uh, solution, one state corresponding to that, and it is the one like i drawn here, okay? But what's important is really, bound states, discrete energy spectrum motion is confined at all energy values. Now, uh, just to be uh, sure, okay, I just want to tell you that this isn't exactly a bound state, okay, because bound states, the conditions are all energy values. This is a sample potential, but never mind about that, just get into the notion of the motion is being confined. Examples of a bound state is the infinite square ball potential, which is what we look at, and the harmonic oscillator, right? Okay, so that is when energy is less than the potential.